This sermon is titled Faith and Finances, Part 1. Be enriched as you listen. We're going to talk a little bit about faith and finances. Right? So put your hand on your wallet. If you want to say. So we're talking about my wallet. <laughs> I was just joking. We're going to talk about faith and finances, faith and money. Yeah. And uh, now, of course, this is a big subject. The Bible has a lot to say about money, uh, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's a lot to say. So um, I just want to you know, make a couple of disclaimers before we spend uh, these two sermons on faith and finances. Uh, first disclaimer is we are not going to be answering all the big theological questions on money or on faith and money, right? We're not going to be doing that. Uh, we are bringing this two sermon, two part sermons, uh, mainly as an encouragement to those who may be facing challenges financially. So that's where we're coming from. So uh, don't get upset that we didn't answer some of you know, the deep theological questions about money and what about this and what about that. Yeah, we know we cannot do that in two sermons. But the whole intent of these two sermons is to bring encouragement to people who may be struggling in this area of money and finances. So uh, that's the intent, that's the motivation. And today we're going to pray uh, towards the end of the service, I believe, I believe uh, in God releasing miracles financially, right? So I believe that, and I believe that as the word is released, uh, you can expect, if you are going through challenges financially, maybe personally, maybe in your workplace, maybe in your business, uh, you, I want you to have expectation this morning uh, that God will come through for you, and we will pray towards that end, uh, towards the closing of the sermon. So that's the first disclaimer. And then maybe another disclaimer will come up uh, towards the end of this message. Uh, you know, because the moment we start talking about money, the first thing many people think about is the so-called prosperity gospel. You know, and uh, people are so scared all the time. You know, don't talk about money. You'll, you'll be misunderstood as a prosperity preacher and whatnot. You know, those kinds of things. But, you know... Uh, let's face it, if you, if you are reading the Bible, you read about money. From Genesis to Revelation, you read about money. You can't avoid it. It's in the Bible. And so why should we be afraid of talking about money or finances or material things? Because it's all in the Bible. And, uh, and I will, you know, uh, the, 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 the problem is, so uh, maybe towards the end of the sermon, I will address that a little bit on where the error is in the so-called prosperity gospel, uh, but just sit back, relax, and enjoy God's word. Amen? Don't get stressed out. Oh, pastor is talking about faith and money. <laughs> you know, relax. So, we all know this, and let's say this out loud, bold, and strong together. God is my provider, and He is the source of my total supply. Let's say it again. God is my provider. And He is the source of my total supply. Amen? So it doesn't matter if you are employed in a, in a if you are an employee in an organization or if you I are a freelancer or, you know, and nowadays we have lots of freelancers. You could work any, from anywhere to any company in the world, from anywhere in the world. Or if you are, you know, self-employed or you run your own business, whatever. However the means or the ways by which money comes to you, we all look to God as our provider. And ultimately, He is the source of our total supply. He is the source. Your job may be a vehicle, one of the ways by which God gets things to you, but God is your son. We are familiar with Philippians 4.19. Let's read it out loud together. Let's have some energy from the congregation this morning. Let's read it out, Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. How many of your needs will God supply? 
all. My God, my God, God is the source. God will supply. Amen? And he will supply for all of our need. Right? So need in every area of your life, all kinds of needs, maybe money, finances, whatever, God will supply. Jesus talked about things we eat, things we wear, uh, things about our future. He said, don't worry about all these things because your heavenly father knows you have need of all these Things, things, material things, things that pertain to our life on earth. And so God supplies all of these things. And how does he supply? Based on your bank accounts, based on your income, based on your spouse's income? No, he supplies for us according to his riches. So the equation suddenly changes. Because supplied for your life is according to what? Let me hear you. According to what? According to his riches. Not according to the resources we have or the channels through which supply comes. God supplies for our need according to his riches. In glory. That means God is your provider. God is going to provide for you. Not according to what these natural uh, uh, sources that we think of. But God is going to provide for you and me. According to what he can provide. Amen. Now, you don't seem convinced. I know you're all believers. <laughs> but you don't seem convinced. Let's believe the Bible. Amen. The Bible says God will supply according to his riches. According to what he has, he will provide for our needs. And he's going to do it through Jesus Christ. That means in the same way and because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, and in the same way that he expressed mercy and grace in providing Jesus for us, he provides everything else for us. God held nothing back when he provided Jesus. And he's not going to hold anything back when he provides for, to meet your needs. Amen? We need to change our thinking and start thinking aligned to the word of God. So I want to speak for, uh, you know, uh, just bring to our attention a few things uh, along these lines. And God being our provider and so on. Just to encourage. I'm speaking specifically uh, to people who are or may be going through uh, difficult times today. Now God, our provider, designed work. That's very interesting. God said, I will provide for you. And yet at the same time, God designed work for us. And he didn't say, I'll provide for you, sit back under the mango tree and enjoy. <laughs> no, he said, I will provide for you, but here's what I want you to do. And of course, God provides, us, provides for us through work. He can also provide for us through other people. He may put it in somebody's heart just to bless you in some way. That's, you know. Or God can also provide through supernatural unexpected means. We'll, we'll talk about that as well. But we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the first one, which is the norm, which is normative, which is norm. That God has ordained that he would provide for us through this means of work. Now, if you look in the Bible, again, the Bible has a lot to talk about work. In fact, work was designed by God before the fall. Many people think work is a curse. No. Work was, God didn't think about work after the fall. God put work in place prior to the fall. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Bible says that when God placed man, Adam, in the Garden of Eden, he put him there to tend, to cultivate, to tend the garden and to keep it. That is to guard the garden. So Adam was given work to do. The initial work, the first work was cultivation. So sometimes we have this wrong notion that all Adam had to do from morning till evening is to sing hallelujah. No, he had work to do. He had to cultivate the garden. He had to tend to the garden. Obviously, he had to, you know, 
God would tell him, he'd give him understanding of how to do that. But the point is this. Work was designed by God prior to the fall. Work is therefore a God-ordained activity. Or if you want to use a very spiritual term, work is ministry. Ooh. <laughs> You're all in ministry. And work is ministry. Why? Because it's a God-ordained activity. And what is ministry? Ministry is doing anything God wants you to do. So you're all in ministry. Just that your ministry may be, you know, in your IT company. Your ministry may be in your school. It may be in your college. It may be wherever you're working. But you are doing ministry. You're doing a God-ordained activity. Are you with me? So, work was designed by God. And if we come into the New Testament, I'll just quickly mention a few verses where the New Testament is also speaking about work. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11. Let's read it out together, please. Paul writes that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So you see, when you tell somebody, mind your own business, you're quoting scripture. <laughs> Can you say amen? amen? It's right there. You may be angry and tell them, mind your own business. You're quoting scripture. The apostle Paul writes to us. He says, you know, I want you to learn how to just, just mind your own business. Do your work. Do what you have to do. And work with your own hands. It's a God on God thing. Work. In 2 Thessalonians, he continues, chapter 3, verse 12. Let's read it again, please. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. So he was addressing people who didn't want to work in just, you know, busy bodies. And so he tells them, look, I'm telling you, you need to work in quietness. Do your own work. Or in Ephesians, let's read that, Ephesians 4 and verse 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his own, with his hands, what is good, that he may have something to give who has need. Now kind of just think about it. He's addressing people who are, you know, probably stealing things. He says, guys, don't do that. Instead, you work with your own hands so that, of course, you'll have something for yourself. And I want you to think about giving to others. See? So the New Testament is also teaching us, do something. To work with your own hands. So work is a God-ordained thing. And let me make this statement, please. We can infer from the totality of Scripture that God designed work as an expression of stewardship, creativity, and multiplication. So let's say that together. God designed work as an expression of stewardship, creativity, and multiplication. So when you think about work, whatever you're doing, think about it as an, it's an opportunity for you to express your stewardship to God. What does it mean? It means God has actually endowed you with certain gifts, abilities, inclinations, propensities, passions, talents, gifts, whatever language you want to use. But each one of us have been endowed by God with these capabilities. And as a good steward, you're putting these things to work. You're making use of these things. That demonstrates stewardship, that you're a good steward. And in the kingdom of God, the law of promotion is, if you're faithful in what is little, you'll be entrusted with more. So everybody wants more. I want increase God. I want promotion God. But follow the law. The law is, if you're faithful in what is little, he will give you more. What is the little you have? Maybe you have one great talent or one great skill or one great ability, whatever it is. So some of, actually, many of us may have many capabilities, many gifts, a great mix of things that we can do well. Now, if you're a good steward of that, then promotion will come in your life. God will bring it. Are you listening? So, work is therefore an expression of stewardship. 
Whatever resources God has put in your life, when you, when, you, when you put it all together and you're at work, it's an expression saying, God, I'm going to put these things to work uh, for your glory. It's also an opportunity for uh, creativity. That means you're bringing something into being. You're, you're creating something. Maybe it's a new idea, a new product. You're opening up a new market. Maybe uh, you, you know, you're creating something. You're, you're solving a problem. You're addressing a need. Creativity. God is creator. And we are, made, we are all made in his image, so we are all creative. So, Pastor, I'm not creative. You are. You're made in the image of the creator. Maybe you haven't just started your motors yet. <laughs> but you are a creative person. Now, the problem, the solution, whatever you're called, may be different from somebody else. But it's innate in you to be creative. And your work is an opportunity to express that aspect of your creator. And God inspires you and me to be creative. So work is an opportunity to be creative. And work is an opportunity for multiplication. You can, you can imagine back in the garden, Adam planted his seed. A tree came out and what happened? Many fruits. One seed multiplied. So the law of multiplication was in operation before Adam started his work. And his work was only going to be, or not only, but one of the expressions of his work was going to see this multiplication happen. Everywhere he planted a seed, things would multiply. And so whatever you do, is, the work you do is an opportunity for multiplication. You, you know, if you start a business, you're going to create employment for many people. You're going to create products that are going to you know, serve many people. Whatever you do is an opportunity for multiplying. It's an opportunity for wealth creation. So both you, yourself, and other people's needs can be taken care of. Are you listening? So let's say this together one more time. That... What was that statement again? God designed work as an expression of stewardship, creativity, and multiplication. So, when you go to work, think about these three things. I have this beautiful opportunity to demonstrate stewardship, to be creative in whatever I'm doing. Solve problems. Create new services and products or address certain needs. And have the opportunity to multiply whatever, you know, in whatever sphere uh, of work or activity you are involved in. And what the beautiful thing is this, that God, our provider, blesses our work. Let's say this together. God, my provider, blesses my work. So God didn't say, you know, <sighs> go work, toil it out, all the best. I'll see you on Sunday. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, I'll bless your work. You go work, you do something, but I will bless it. And there are many scriptures for this, right? We're going to just... Talk about a few, mention a few. Look at Deuteronomy 28 and verse 12. Now let's read that together. The Lord will open to you. Let me hear you please. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You will lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Now think about this. Now, you know, of course, it, the Bible is all talking all about cultivation, farming, livestock, sheep and goats and camels and donkeys. Today, you and I, in the urban context, you know, what is this? But if God was talking to you today in the urban context, he'd probably talk to you about, you know, your IT systems. He'd talk to you about your sales, your revenues, your marketing, your profits. And then he'll talk in that language. So all we have to do as we read the Bible is translate from cultivation, produce, livestock, translate it into what it means for you in modern context. God will just use our language. 
So here he's talking about rain coming down. And God says, I will bless you in all the work of your hands. So put your hands in front of you. Hope you brought your hands with you. <laughs> Just put it in front of you and say, God blesses me in all the work of my hands. Let's say it like we really believe it. God blesses me in all the work of my hands. Amen. You see, I took this literally when I was a bachelor and I had to cook. You know, for several years, uh, being a bachelor, studying in, in the U.S., I had to cook or to make dal, chicken. I said, God, thank you. You bless all the work of mine because I have to eat it. But, you know, whatever we do, whatever we do, God has promised to bless all the work of our and believe it. Yes, he will bless whatever you're doing. He said, I will bless you in all the work of your hands. No, no, very simple. The word bless, one of the meanings is to prosper. See, people are so afraid of prosperity, but they pray, Lord, bless me. Seriously, and you're thinking these people, if they're in their right mind, what they're actually saying is, God, prosper me. And then they come and fight against us when we tell God wants to prosper you. Hey, you're praying, God bless me. If you just interpret it according to the Hebrew, you're praying, God prosper me. Are you listening? Now, what does the blessing of God do? Just make you feel good? What is the outcome of God blessing the work of your hands? Now, give us one scripture. Proverbs 10, verse 22. Let's read it together, please. Let's read it loudly. I want you to be convinced about it. The blessing of the Lord, it make it rich. And he adds no. Let's read it one more time. The blessing of the Lord, it makes one rich. And he adds no. See, this is the Bible. Proverbs 10 verse 22. What is the blessing of God on the work of your hands? What does it do? It makes one rich. It brings about increase. It brings about growth. The blessing of God is not just to make you feel good. The blessing of the Lord has tangible outcomes. It has real results. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. It brings about increase. And he adds no sorrow with it. Unlike if you have increased through wrong means and methods, you could achieve increase, but then you'll have a lot of sorrow. But when it comes through the blessing of the Lord, you can have increase and no sorrow. And that's the kind of increase we want. Amen? So the blessing of God brings increase. And God said, I'll bless you in all the work of your hands. I just want to mention, references two more scriptures. It's Psalm 128, verses 1 and 2. Let's read it, please. Let's go. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you will be happy, and it shall be well with you. Now think about that. When you eat the labor of your hands, you will be happy. See, some of us are working, or some people work, 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 and they're so unhappy. But he said, the word of God says, you know, you're blessed. If you fear God, you're blessed. That word blessed simply means to be prosperous. Blessed is everyone who fears God. When you eat the labor of your hands, you will be happy. And it will be well with you. Things will go well with you. So there is the reward here. And uh, next Sunday, we'll, Gene will minister more on that. Um, the outcome of being blessed by God in your work. Now, another interesting passage in Isaiah 65, verses 25, 21 and 22. Now, if you read the context... Isaiah 65, 21 to 22, the context is actually the millennium. 
It's talking about the millennial reign of Christ, Isaiah 65, 21, 20. Actually, that whole passage, there are a couple of verses that talk about the new heavens and the new earth. And then verse 21, uh, this part of the passage talks about the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. You say, how do you know it? Because it's a parallel passage to, you know, Isaiah chapter 2 and Isaiah chapter 11. And you compare that with Isaiah 65. And then you find all the texts are in parallel. Therefore, you say this text is talking about the millennium. Right? So you can take it that way and understand it that way. So in the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth, this is what Isaiah foretold. In Isaiah 65, verse 21 and 22, let's read it, please. What will happen in the millennium? Let's read it. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. But as the days of a tree, so shall the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Now think about it. God says in the millennium, that's when Jesus is reigning. This is how his reign will be. You will plant, you will eat. You will build, you will live in it. These days you plant, somebody else. You build, somebody else comes and takes it off. I mean, there is injustice and all these difficult things happen. But in the millennia, he said, you plant, you will eat. That means you'll enjoy the fruit of your labor. You will enjoy the, the work of your hands. He says, my elect, that's my people, will enjoy the work of their hands. Now, why is this important? Because as a believer, if you look at Hebrews 6 and verse 5, the Bible tells us that we have a foretaste of the powers of the kingdom to come. In other words, God is willing to give you an advance share, an advance enjoyment of the blessings of the kingdom to come. In other words, hey, I'll give you a little portion ahead of it. You know, sometimes you come to the table and you say, first, can I have the dessert before I have the main course? And then I'll finish the dessert afterwards. It's like that. Okay? Are you with me? So the point is this. You and I can say, Lord, your word says that I will have a foretaste of the powers of the kingdom to come. And in the kingdom to come, this is how it's going to be. I will plant and I will eat. I will build and I will live in it. And I'll enjoy the work of my hands. I know in the world that I am living today, it's a fallen world, and there is a lot of evil and injustice and corruption and oh, violence, all kinds of things. But I am somebody who is entitled to taste of the things of the kingdom to come, and I want to taste it here and now. Are you with me? You can pray like that. It's biblical, Hebrews 6 verse 5. Say, God, I want that. Amen? Amen. So God has promised to bless you and me in the work of our hands. And so, you know, I want you to think about it and say, God, when I go to work, thank you, you promised to bless me here. Thank you that you promised, you know, whatever you do, the blessing of God is on you, on your work. Expect it. Expect it to bless your stewardship, your multiplication, your creativity. Expect that to be blessed by God. Now, you know, just a side note, somebody may, you know, uh, you know, argue, say, well, every verse you've quoted is from the Old Testament. Yeah, but, you know, we don't have time. I could quote from the New Testament as well. Uh, but, you know, in order to counter that argument, it's a very simple thing. Has God changed across testaments? God said, I am God, I do not change. If he said to his people in the old covenant, I will bless the work of your hands, how much more to people in the new covenant? Are you with me? Now, some people argue, oh, you're only quoting Old Testament scriptures. Well, tell me one place in the New Testament, that means between Matthew and the book of Jude, where you find musical instruments. Do you know you don't find musical instruments between Matthew and Jude? Only in Revelation. Now, do you conclude, therefore, 
that the New Testament church must not use musical instruments only after you go to heaven, guitar and drums and all? Why? Because between Matthew and Jude, no mention of musical instruments in worship. Then he said, from where do we get the understanding of musical instruments in worship? Old Testament. It's full of it. Then, no instruments between Matthew and Jude. Next time you see instruments is in Revelation. So, is your theological deduction no musical instruments in the New Testament church? That would be an erroneous conclusion. Why? Because in the Old Testament, they worshipped God with instruments. Are you with me? So, I'm just trying to be logical. Right? Sometimes we... Uh, we get so illogical in our reading of the scriptures. Back to the main sermon. <laughs> the next point I want to bring our attention to is that God, our provider, works miracles of provision. Amen? Let's say this together. God, my provider, works miracles of provision. You see... While God has ordained our work to be a normal means by which he provides for us, and so we can all, we need to be good and conscientious about our work. Uh, we need to look at it as an expression of stewardship, creativity, and multiplication, and we expect God to bless our work, and, and, and God will do that. But I also want us to be very aware that God will do miracles of provision. Amen? That means God is not limited to your work. That is, of course, a, a God-ordained means by which he's going to bring provision. But God works miracles of provision. He can give you more. That, that he, he can bring into your life more than what comes through your paycheck. You believe it? He can provide. He can give to you more than what money can buy. He can bring that into your life. And in the Bible, both the old and the new, there are numerous miracles of unusual, unexpected ways for God to provide for people. Let, just, let me just mention these to you, which are all very familiar. You know, there was a supernatural provision of water out of a rock. There was supernatural provision of manna and quail. This is in the, all this in the Old Testament. There was a supernatural food delivery through Swiggy to the prophet Elijah. There was multiplying the last portion of a widow's flour and oil to sustain her and his son and the prophet through famine. There was multiplying the last portion of oil to cancel debt and to bring a huge revenue that would take care of the rest of her life of a widow and her children. There was a turning of water to wine to meet the need in a marriage feast. There was a supernatural catch of fish in the morning after a fruitless night of work. You remember Peter and, and his uh, team members, they toiled all night. They never caught anything. And here they come on the morning when it's not the time to go fishing. Jesus says, go out into the deep and they ca catch a big load of fish. There's a supernatural coin in the mouth of a fish. There's a multiplying of bread and fish to feed thousands of people. Now those were miracles in Bible times. But the God of the Bible is the God of today. Let's say it together. Let me hear you. The God of the Bible is the God of today. Amen. It's the same God. He hasn't changed. The nature of the miracles will change. In those days, it was all about fish and, you know, water and uh, those kinds of things. Today, the miracles may be different in nature, but it's the same God working miracles in your life and mine. And God still works miracles of provision and supernatural supply. God still works miracles. He can orchestrate things for you. In your circumstances, in your situations. And bring supernatural increase in your life. So I want all of us to expect God to do so today. Expect God to work miracles for you today. Let's say this together. I expect God to do miracles of provision in my life today. 
God will do it. You know, God will work these miracles of provision for your life and mine. And so we must exercise faith to receive his miracles of provision. There's nothing wrong. Worship team, please come. There's nothing wrong in exercising faith to receive miracles of provision. You know, in Matthew 6, where Jesus was talking about, you know, what clothes you wear and what food you eat. And he said, don't worry about the future. He was contrasting worry. And then instead, he taught us to have faith. He said, why are you worrying, oh, you of little faith? In other words, if you put it in a, in a, in a, in a different way, you could say, he was saying, don't worry, have faith in God. For what? For all these things. You know, what you eat, what you wear, uh, 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 about your tomorrow, uh, about your future. Don't worry. All these things that you have need of, don't worry. Have faith in God. And you seek God. And all these things will be added to you. Amen? So we must have faith. And Jesus taught us in Mark 11, verse 24, he said, What things soever you desire, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you will have them. You believe that you got it before you get it, and then you'll have it. But he said, whatever you desire, what things, you know, things means your food, food you eat, clothes you wear, the things that pertain to everyday life. The material things. What things ever you desire. So when you pray. Believe that you receive. And you will have them. So. We believe that God blesses his people. In all areas of life. Including materially. Financially. Professionally. We see this throughout the Bible. And so it's not wrong for us to pray. And ask God to bless us. It's not wrong for us to have faith in God for provision, for increase, for promotion. Gene will talk about that next Sunday. It's wrong, not wrong for us to do that. And we see this throughout the Bible. We see God blessing his people, providing for his people. We also see that men of great faith managed great finances. Abraham, David, others. So faith and finances are not enemies. Somehow we have this wrong notion that if you're a person of great faith, you're going to be a great person of great poverty. That's not biblical understanding. Because the father of faith, Abraham, was highly blessed. So much so the Philistines envied him. When was the last time your co-worker envied you? Abraham was so blessed that even the Philistines and beat him. And Abraham was called the father of faith. But where we do go wrong. And I'm just mentioning this for clarity. If we use faith solely as a means for material gain. We go wrong. Faith is to love God. To walk with God. To be completely devoted to him. And yes, he will bless us financially. But if we use faith only to receive material blessing, as Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, 5, where people have thought of godliness as a means for gain. See, for them, I'll be holy because only I get money. That is wrong. Or if we equate faith to great money, that means... Oh, you have a lot of money, that means you have great faith. No, we don't equate that because Paul, James said there are people who are of great faith, but they may be poor in this world. Right? So this is where the prosperity gospel has gone wrong, where some have used faith in order to make money. Uh, that's the only thing. Or some have equated faith to a lot of money. So if we avoid these two errors, we can enjoy the rest of the Bible. Enjoy what the Bible says. Are you with me? So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Are you listening? Just get the correct understanding of the scriptures. 
So we know faith is not just about making money. Money is one of the many things God blesses us with. Our faith is more than that, of course. But God does bless us. The blessing of the Lord does make one rich. He adds no sorrow with it. He blesses us in all the work of our hands. He enables us to enjoy the fruit of our labor and it will be well with us. This is God's provision, God's blessing so that we can be a blessing. Amen? In the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2, and this is the passage we're going to close with. It's not in the slide, in the, in the presentation, but... In Joel chapter 2, the people of God have um, gone through uh, a time of judgment because of their lack of obedience to God and all of that. But then, in the latter part of chapter 2, verses 21 to 27, Joel begins to speak to them by the word of the Lord and says, this is what God will do for you. He'll turn things around for you. And that's the word I want to speak over us today. And as I do that, I want you to receive that word for you. Especially for those who might be going through difficult times financially. Because I'm not just reading a passage. But I believe it's a word of proclamation. It's, a, it's an announcement to you and me today that this is what God will do for you. And so, I want you to connect with the Word of God. Say, God, if you did that for people, then I want you to do it for me today. You're the same God. You're the same God. So let's stand up to our feet, please. Joel chapter 2, verses 21 to 27. Joel tells the people, you know, they've gone through a very difficult time. They've gone through a very devastating time. They've gone through a very, a time where they experienced destruction. Things were not well. Things were not good. The produce of the land had gone. Their livestock had gone. All of that had gone. Now, I just want you in your mind to translate all of that language to our day and time today. Right? God is speaking to them about the fig tree, about the wine, about the livestock, about the land. Because that was their context in, the Bible time, in Bible times. Today, your context may be your workplace, your business, uh, whatever you're doing. Translate that in your mind and receive this word. God will fulfill it. So Joel begins by telling the people, he says, Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. For the Lord has done marvelous things, great things. So I want to tell you, do not fear, but be glad and rejoice because the Lord will do great things. Now why shouldn't you be afraid? Verse 22, do not be afraid, you beasts of the field. For the open pastures are springing up. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the wine yield their strength. Or you can read it like this. The business is springing up. The projects are being fruitful. The sales and the revenues and the marketing is yielding its, its increase. Do not be afraid. Because what you do will begin to be fruitful. And then he says, verse 23, be glad. Why can you be glad? He says, be glad then you children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God. So be glad and rejoice in God. Don't be afraid. Be glad and rejoice. Why? Because he has given you the former rain faithfully and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former and the latter rain in the first month. You see, during seed time, when they were sowing seed, the former rain came. And during harvest time, the latter rain came in order to ripen the harvest, uh, ripen the fruit for harvest. 
So they depended on the former and the latter rain. They depended on this. And he's saying, you know, God's been faithful to you. When you were sowing seed, he gave you the rain. And now when harvest time comes, he will give you both the former and the latter. And he will make sure that your harvest comes forth to full fruitfulness so that you can receive your harvest. So he says, be glad and rejoice. Be glad and rejoice. Don't be afraid. The trees will begin to bear their fruit. The fig tree will produce. The wine will begin to produce. What is it that you're doing? Fear not. Don't be afraid. God will cause what you do to begin to bear fruit. Be glad and rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord your God because He will pour the rain down to make sure that the work of your hands will produce. He will do it. And He has been faithful. And He will do it. Look at verse 24. He says, The threshing floors will be full of meat. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. So you can think about this. Your revenues will overflow. Your profits will overflow. Your income will overflow. Verse 25. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. So he says, you know, these locusts had come and they had destroyed the land. But God says, I will restore what those locusts have destroyed. And God will restore to you and to me whatever has been destroyed, whatever destruction, whatever devastation you and I may have experienced in the past, God will restore. God will bring back. And God always brings back double. Look at the next verse. He says in verse 26, You will eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. He once again states it in verse 27, Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God. There is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. To shame. Let's say this together. God says. Let's say together. God says. My people shall never be put to shame. Let's say it again. God says. My people shall never be put to shame. I want to announce to you. God tells you. My people shall never be put to shame. You will not be put to shame. You will be honored. You will be promoted. You will be able to hold your head up high and say, look what the Lord has done. The Lord who is in my life. The Lord who is dwelling with me. Look what the Lord has done. My people shall never be put to shame. Amen. Can you say an amen? Father, in the name of Jesus. We declare your holy word over your people, God, that you will fulfill your words. Father, I pray that people will experience the supernatural work of God in their finances, in their workplaces, in their businesses, in whatever they do. Let the blessing of the Lord cause increase. Let the blessing of the Lord bring about a ton around, a change, a supernatural change in their situations, God. And that every child of God be able to hold their head up high because you said, my people shall never be put to shame. My people will never be put to shame. Let them be honored. Let them be rewarded. Let them be promoted. Let them be lifted up. Let them see the goodness of God in their lives, Father. Everyone, everyone, those watching online, wherever they are, Lord, let the power of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, touch them. Touch them in their life situations. Let the miracle working power of God transform their workplaces, transform their businesses, transform what they do. Even as you spoke in Joel, 
Whatever the locust has eaten, God, restore with double measure. Restore with double measure. Because that's who you are. That's who you are. The worship team will lead us. I want you to take this time just to engage with God. You Our God. Go ahead, please. Are, you are we make a miracle work a promise keep light in the darkness my God and that is who you are let's declare that you are we make a miracle work a promise keeper light in the darkness my God and that is who you are you're the way maker I want you to expect God to do some wonderful things in your life. And it's not wrong. It's not wrong to expect God to bless you. Because He said, I will bless. I will bless all the work of your hands. So it's not wrong to ask Him, to believe Him, expect Him. He will do it. Before we close this morning, you know, we always like to give an invitation for people to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
There could be people who are in the auditorium, people watching online. And you've never received Jesus into your life. You know, like we said, faith is not about money. It's just one of the many things in life. But faith is really about relationship with God and knowing God becoming a child of God and being part of the family of God knowing that your sins are forgiven and you're in right relationship with God that's what it's all about and if you've never received Jesus Christ into your life you've never made a decision to believe in Jesus doesn't matter what your background is we want to give you an opportunity today to do this I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer and I want you to pray with me and say I will believe in Jesus Jesus never came to be one among a million gods. He came to be the Lord. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what he said. So the invitation this morning is not add Jesus to your list of gods, but to believe in Jesus as the only way the only truth, the only life. And if you're willing to do that, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me, whoever you are, by your own free choice and your own free will, you can join me in this prayer. Let's pray. Just say this with me, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins on the cross. I believe you rose up again. You're alive today. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. And help me to follow you. And you alone. The rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. 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 The Bible says. There is great rejoicing in heaven over one person who turns to God. Is there anybody here this morning for the first time you prayed that prayer with me and you gave your heart to Jesus? I want to see your hand, please. Anybody who prayed the prayer with me first time, just raise your hand. Anybody in this auditorium, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time? Just raise your hand. We want to celebrate with you. I don't see any hands here this morning. Well, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Amen. If you did that, maybe you were shy, raising, raising your hand. We do have our greeters, our ushers um, at the exits. They have a bag. It's called a new believer's bag. And you can just tell them, you know, I prayed that prayer. I was a little shy to raise my hand. Can I have that bag? And they'll, they'll gladly give it to you. You can just write your name on a card. They'll hand it back to you. And we'll be in touch with you uh, to tell you how to use the resources that are in the bag. We'll close with a benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit and His abounding blessing in every area of our lives increase in each of us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.